Hi everyone, this is Brittany Bond and welcome back to the podcast. Today I am reporting live from Burning Man. And the reason why I'm making a podcast right now and not outside building things is because it's fucking raining here. Um, last year was like the first year that they had rain uh, since I think the burn started. And this, you probably know this if you're watching the news at all because it like made international news it definitely made national news here in america but um people a lot of people who didn't know what burning man was before like found out about it through the fact that it rained and it was messy and here we are again it is raining um and i'm looking outside i'm basically i'm sitting in the camper van i made a little recording studio if you're watching this visually because there's three of us lovely women living in this camper van and um, Luna and Raquel are in the back having a nice tea and talking and I decided to make a little bubble up here and um, and make a little recording studio. So here we go. Um, you're going to catch this after Burning Man because I, we don't have Wi-Fi here. I don't have reception, which is great. That's pulled the whole part of the experience. And also I thought it would be really fun to capture different moments along the way. So I'm gonna just going to be filming and releasing different vlogs from <laughs> snippets of our Burning Man adventure. And oh my God, it has been such an adventure already. Um, so I want to talk about that in this podcast, just like life updates. And also I was talking to Luna, uh, one of the girls that I came to on this adventure with um, and yesterday. And we were talking about, she was asking me about my journey into my own sensuality sexuality and like basically coming into the embodiment of that like she was super curious because of the way I was raised like how have I gone from being raised in this very religious conservative environment where you know masturbation is like the worst thing that you could do and <laughs> you need to be married in order to have sex like how did I go from that programming and culture to organizing you know sex parties in Thailand and being very open about being in my sexual embodiment and just really in my pleasure and enjoying it so like I want to talk about that in this podcast I got really excited I was like oh this is whenever I get excited about something I'm like I want to also share this in a podcast because I feel like if one person's asking this then it can probably help more people so yeah Let's dive right into that. Um, if you're watching visually, you can see that I have my cute little braids in. Uh, this is the first time I ever got my braids, like braids done on my head. And I love it so much. I love it so much. And we went into a Walmart. <laughs> so funny to be back in America. Also something to know that is if you're actually from the United States of America, you never say America unless you've been gone for too long. <laughs> we always say going to the States or I'm from the States. So this is when I know that I've been gone too long because I'm like, America. <laughs> but anyways, um, we went to Walmart, which is a very American thing, to get supplies for Burning Man. And everyone was giving us tons of compliments on our hair because all three of us girls have our hair done like this. And I just really love it. I very much enjoy it. And the, the lady who did my hair was also really amazing. Um... I probably will get it done one more time while I'm in the States. <sighs> so, yes. Um, first off, I want to update you on our Burning Man adventure. We got our um, U-Haul, like, our U-Haul. I'm looking outside and it says U-Haul on, on a truck. Anyways, um, we have a 10-meter camper van. Parked it, I think in the last podcast I updated you that we, like, parked it. Raquel parked it in this RV park for a year and so we were supposed to have it already like ready to go when we got back but it was not at all and they had lost the keys so I think that's the last time I updated you well fast forward we uh, they ended up getting a new key made they, they called the locksmiths and they came and got new keys for us like they made a whole new one and um we ended up driving our rental car into Reno, like it was an hour away from Reno, and we got our hair done, we got a bunch of stuff done, and they promised they would drive the the camper van to us, like after the key was made, because it was supposed to take like hours and hours, and we were like, okay, well we need to go do a bunch of errands and stuff, 
And they said w- they would bring it to us at like 5 p.m. And they didn't bring it to, to us till like 11.30 at night. And we already had to return the rental car. So we were just like sitting inside Applebee's with like all of our stuff. Like we had like done a bunch of washing, like washed the bed sheets for the camper van and like our laundry. <laughs> and so we have just like armfuls of laundry we brought into <laughs> to Applebee's and just like tons of luggage. We were just... It was just very funny. We were just like homeless for a minute in Applebee's for a couple hours. And we were all so tired because we still had so much jet lag. And and the, the thing is, is that they just, they kept saying, yes, we're coming. This is what made us all feel a little crazy is they kept saying, yeah, we're coming in like 30 minutes. And then it takes an hour to get from one place to the other. So then like an hour has passed and then we called them. They're like, oh no, we're just leaving right now. And, it, and they kept doing this for hours. So there was like no understanding of like what we needed to do because we just they kept telling us they were coming and then they weren't and like we, we were like if you're not coming then we need to you know get a hotel room finally they came and um and then w- after they left we we had spent the whole day before like we had figured out a way to like break into the camper van like one of the windows was open so we jumped the battery got the generator going you know cleaned everything moved in and so everything was like fixed except for we needed to get a new key made to actually start the engine, right? So when they brought the camper van back to us <laughs> in Reno, suddenly nothing was working again. Like we had b- already bought groceries. Um, we had done like one run of grocery shopping and the fridge was had been turned off. And we were like, oh fuck, like now all the food's going to go bad. And like the generator wasn't working they said they had put water in the <coughs> in the tank so that we could take showers. Like nothing was turning on, and then we called them. You know the people who brought the camper van to us, and we were like, "Hey, nothing's working," and they were like, "Oh, we'll come right back out and help you get it turned on," and they never came. So it felt like we had just spent like forty eight hours with like let's just we kept saying like not the divine masculine because it was like these men. It was just all men, and they they were like, "Yeah, we're gonna help you," and they like did did, did the opposite of helping us, and was not communicative, was not <coughs> not helpful in any way. So we all had a little bit of a cry, <laughs> and I I was just I kind of hit this point of like frustration shutdown where I just couldn't really f- talk anymore because you know like for me not getting sleep is really is really kind of my kryptonite. Um, I can handle most crises if I have enough sleep. Uh, But this had been like days and days of getting like two or three hours a night of sleep. And and also dealing with the girls and everything. We're all very strong personalities. (laughs) And everyone has a very different way of handling situations. And for me, I have done a lot of uh, personal work on being able to stay in my divine feminine, stay calm. And I was like doing my best to do this the whole time. And other of us in the group are not doing that uh, or they're doing their best to handle it in whatever way they could. But it was just like, I think it was just so stressful for all of us. Um, But we pulled it together and the next morning, um, Raquel, um, one of the other, the lady who, my friend who's leading us on this, it's her fifth burn and this is her camper van. She called a mechanic and he came out and fixed everything. Or we thought he had fixed everything. He did his best. His name was Mark Sweet. His last name was Sweet. He was really cute. Super sweet guy. Fixed everything that he could think of to fix. Got everything turned on. Generator, the battery. We bought a new battery but for the house. Because there's like one for the front car and there's one for the actual house. Which runs like for the fridge and, you know, the the water tank and stuff. To get everything like working. Ah, so we start driving. It takes about two hours to get from Reno to um, the beginning of the (coughs) the Burning Man. They call it Playa. So to get to the beginning of of the Playa. And um, halfway there, we stopped to fill up the rest of the water tank and uh, get gas and like stuff like that. And (laughs) Raquel goes to pump the gas and she puts the the (laughs) the gas in the like she puts the she puts it in and all of a sudden we start hearing just like pouring liquids so she's pumping it in and there's literally it's not a leak it's like an actual hole in the gas tank so the gas was just pouring straight out the bottom and we're just like 
I just, I just cannot, I can't talk anymore at this point. I'm just like, I can't handle one more problem. <laughs> but the people at this gas station, they were like, it was all a bunch of men again. And they were all like, I would consider all of us women were like, they are the divine masculine. Cause they were so helpful. They called like a mechanic that was right down the road and they were like, go, go talk to Bobby <laughs> at this mechanic shop. It was like literally like one minute away. So we drove over. And Bobby got under our gas tank for two hours and fixed it. We don't know what he did. Magic. Magic, Bobby. Bobby is magic. And he didn't even charge us. So, like, Raquel was like, what? You don't want any money? And he's like, no, no, it's fine. Just go. And, like, literally, this is Bobby's job. <laughs> so it really made us very happy. And then we went back to the gas station to fill up the water tank and... um this guy named Jeffrey who worked there he was super helpful he like checked our oil because we had forgot to check the oil he like made sure that the water tank was like properly working and he just is like a, he just works at the gas station but he was like super helping us and always ah, so it felt like we had one day of like or two days because it was like 48 hours at this RV park thing of like non-divine masculine and just us being really overwhelmed because you know, when Raquel was here last year, she bought the camper van last year with her boyfriend, her ex-boyfriend now. <coughs> so her ex, like, was kind of the one who knew the stuff on how to fix things on the RV. And so now it's like she kind of knows how to fix things. And then me and Luna, Luna and I have no clue how to fix anything on a camper van. And so suddenly it's like three women just trying to figure everything out. <laughs> and... um I'm going to do a tour of the inside of this camper van so you can watch that that vlog. But it's not like a small camper van. It's 10 meters, like a whole apartment in here. It's got like a full fridge and a full freezer, a nice shower, like, and we each individually. So then we drove each of us individually. Like, I, di I didn't think that I would be comfortable to drive this camper van. <laughs> but this is the thing. It's like when the mechanic was fixing, when Bobby, the mechanic, was fixing us, uh, fixing our, our gas tank, I hit this point of just overwhelm where I was like, I felt like I was almost drunk or something, but I don't drink alcohol anymore, but I was just like, I feel, and I started to feel really like sick to my stomach, like I was going to puke, like nauseous. And I just said to the girls, I was like, I have to go lay down, like I, I don't feel well. And I think it was just this overwhelm of lack of sleep and just problems that I don't know how to solve <laughs> like I literally am like I don't know how to do these things so I just told them the girls like let me w wake me up if you need me because we weren't sh it was like an unlimited amount of undetermined amount of time that it was going to take to fix this gas tank and so something that's super interesting is like so Raquel like all of us are super open about this stuff that like Raquel was like wanting to be more in her feminine she's very successful in her company but she's you know admitted that she's leading in her masculine energy and she wants to be more in her feminine and then luna so raquel's gonna be 42 and luna is 27 gonna be 28 we're all exactly seven years apart which is super interesting so then luna who's like 27 is like i want to be more in my masculine i'm too in my feminine and i'm just here in the middle like I'm, I feel like I'm both, <laughs> like I'm balanced in the middle. So for, cause, because for me, like saying like, I need to go lay down and then let me know when you need me is me like honoring my feminine energy of like, I need to rest. I need to receive in this moment some like, you know, like rest and recharge. And when I woke up, like Raquel was like, um, I feel like I'm, I'm doing everything for you guys and for you ladies. And like, I feel like I'm your boyfriend. And I just like, basically she wanted to be more in her feminine. And this, she admitted later, she's like, I was upset at you both, but really I needed to just go take charge of my own self and like me rest. And I can understand because at that point I can understand her overwhelm because at that point she thought she was going to have to drive another hour and a half and she was tired. And like, she was leaning on a lot of the stuff because, you know, Luna and I really didn't know what was going on. And we'd never been to Burning Man. Like we really are very much virgins in this, all of these situations. But I said to I said to Raquel, I was like, okay, I'm gonna drive the camper van the rest of the way. Like you just get it on the freeway, and then it's a straight shot, and then I will figure out how to drive this, and then you can go lay down. And um, and then Luna was like, actually, Raquel, why don't you go lay down right now? And Brittany and I will figure out how to get the water in the water tank. We'll figure out all the rest of the stuff at the gas station, and then we'll wake you up so that you can 
go help drive to the freeway and then Brittany will take over. And so Raquel went and laid down. Luna and I, like, like we had to fill up the rest of, we had like extra gas, like tanks that we need for, for when we're here on the playa. And also, you know, I, t- I like smooth talk my way with Jeffrey, the gas t- attendant guy, and he was super helpful. So we figured it all out. And then when we woke up Raquel, she drove us, <coughs> drove like, to like where the road got straight <laughs> on the freeway on the little highway and then I took over and actually at that moment Raquel was like actually I'm super happy to just chill in the front seat with Brittany and Luna you go rest because Luna like hadn't gotten any sleep the night before because we were all like super stressed and it was just really beautiful because like Raquel was like I was like I had all these stories in my head that you know I would brought both of you women we're all super open about everything so I really love this um because she's like I had all these stories in my head that like I brought both of you women and now I have to do it all on my own like I have to be my masculine again I don't want to and then she's like and then you totally kick my butt and I was like what do you mean I totally kick your butt she's like well you just stepped up like you and Luna just were like okay no we're handling things like I'm driving and I did drive like the rest of the way and then when we got to the playa which is like where the desert is like the beginning of Burning Man I had Luna jump on and drive and Luna was so scared of driving like she's like um is a big deal for her that she drove so I was really proud of her um but yeah like Raquel was just saying like I'm really proud of both of you for you know showing me that you can do both (laughs) I'm waving at our camp lead Simon because he's like you're making a podcast I'm like yes I'm making a podcast there's nothing to do it's raining um so yeah I feel like we're all like working on everything together and it feels really nice like Raquel like we were all talking the three of us and Raquel was like I feel like being with both of you is helping me to be more of my feminine and Luna was like I feel like being with both of you is helping me to be more of my masculine and then they looked at me they're like Brittany what, what are you getting out of this and I'm like well I was really excited to go to Birdie Man <laughs> but also it's just fun to be with women that are amazing and we all can talk about everything to me that's like really nourishing to be around beautiful feminine energy uh, where we are we're like emotionally mature and we can be upset and angry at each other and then talk it out and that's really beautiful for me because I'm all about the emotions like let's talk about everything right like for me it's not about if something bad happens it's like are we in it together are we doing it as a team and do we feel like we're able to be heard and like nourished and supported like support that is actually supportive and nourishing and where we can be ourselves and I feel like all three of us feel like we can do that with each other and you have to know that we don't actually know each other very well like I've never hung out with these women one-on-one before this experience like we've hung out together all three of us planning the trip and I know Raquel for like five years on the island but just like through the community you know so it's one big experiment it's going really well I'm super happy and yeah I just wanted to give you that update so like we got to the playa and it takes a long line to check in there was like tons of cars even though it was nighttime and so this was really beautiful because I already had gone to sleep when Luna started driving and they decided to pull over and just sleep in the they call it sleeping on the line where it's like we in the check-in line where we haven't checked in all the way and to me that is them making a decision to us have us be more in our feminine because apparently we talked to Simon our camp lead when we got here and he said that sometimes people will just stay up all night just to check in and he's like why what's the point why not just go rest if you're in a fucking camper van so I feel like we're all like being more and more balanced in our our masculine and our feminine and that's really nice and this whole experience is just so cool like when we got here and we started driving um we fixed up our bicycles and um like our camp is our camp is full of like a couple of young people but that a lot a lot of them are originally from New Zealand which is random and cool and they're all like in their late 40s or early 50s which is also really cool because a lot of camps um it's like people our age like in their 30s um and I feel like it's just nourishing to be with a little bit of older crowd because they're all like super nice and helpful and they have kids that are like in their 20s that are going to come on Monday so it's just cool to have like two generations of burners here but they helped us one of the guys helped us get all of our um, bicycles fixed up I basically we like dropped back into like a camp of like divine masculine (laughs) because they're super helpful they're like helping us on a bunch of stuff on the RV that we weren't able to figure out ourselves 
and it just feels like yeah really nourishing to be in their energy like yesterday they were like just rest you know and then they had us um the girls painted like the activity board um i would show you but it's um it's hard to <laughs> pick it up and turn it around right now um but basically it had us do artsy things and just rest and while they like kind of built up the camp yesterday and today we were supposed to help them but now it's raining <sighs> but I guess it's supposed to, I think after today it's going to clear up. And um, as long as it doesn't rain too much, like if the sun comes out, Raquel was saying if, if it doesn't rain too much and the sun comes out, then it'll dry up really fast. It's just that if it rains like a lot all in a row, then it can't really dry up. And then once it gets like muddy, that's when you're kind of fucked because like your boots get stuck. It's like, it's like walking through like quicksand and you can't really ride your bicycles and stuff. But we went to, uh, yesterday we at sunset, we went we bicycled over to, like, the man. So, like, in the middle of Burning Man is a structure that they burn at the end. And it's, like, built in the shape of a man. And it's, like, all made of wood so that it can burn. And then, like, directly in front of that is what they call the temple. And it's also made of wood so it can burn at the end. And then the temple is where you can go and, like, leave, like, letters to people who have died in your life and, like you know flowers and anything that's burnable that you want to burn that like uh, is honoring dead loved ones that you can put in the temple so we went and bicycled out there and um burning man is made so that like there's this huge circle uh which is where all the art in the temple and, and the burning man the actual man is and then like all the camps are around the circle right our camp is literally one street over from the main circle. So like usually that's really hard to find a camp so close to like basically where all the action is, but ours is like super close. And so I'm super grateful. Basically like Raquel was like, we have a great spot to like, um, and our camp is gonna do parties and all of us girls are gonna basically be like the bartenders <laughs> and like the ones getting everyone into the party. <laughs> Because the thing with Burning Man is that you don't, like, once you get here, there's no money. So, and every camp, um, like, the camps, like when you sign up for a camp, they have what they call a camp fee. And so you pay, you like, you like pay money into your camp, and then your camp brings an offering for Burning Man. So it can be anything from, like, food. Like, some camps are, like, like, there's a camp near us that does, like, chai and waffles every morning from, like, 9 to 11. And so everyone can go anyone can go and get chai and waffles from them right and so and it goes like it goes from that to like they have camps that just fix bicycles they have camps that are like i went so i looked up we haven't there's an app for the burning man that shows you all the camps and like a map of where everything is which is amazing and so i went through this morning and i was just like looking up all the different ideas of what camps could be and there's there's an orgy dome which i'm going to go to and see if i can facilitate some like conscious connection stuff and I want to volunteer there and that's like the orgy dome's super famous here because for people who are not in the conscious community like a lot of people who come to Burning Man they they kind of live in the normal world you know and like this is like their one time a year to come and be in a conscious community type of world which is funny for me because I come from Copenhagen where like this is my life um but from what I heard through multiple friends is that the orgy dome is not very um it's not very conscious. It's like just people fucking. <laughs> it's like very performative. It's not like heart connection or or like a lot of like they encourage consent, of course, like no one's getting raped or anything, but it's just like it's like less talking and more just performing. And so I'm going to go there and see if I can um offer some conscious connection type of games and stuff like that. But some other types of camps they have, they have a spa camp where you can go get your nails done and get foot massages. They have a sauna camp. So they actually have like a one camp that's just a steam sauna. So when you're out here in the dust all day long, you can go there and just like steam it all away. They have another one that's a dry sauna that's like Swedish people who come and bring the, build a, a dry sauna. There's even one that is a braid camp. So once our hair starts getting like not nice anymore, we can go get our hair rebraided, which I'm super excited for. And then, of course, there's tons of, like, workshops. There's, like, conscious connecting workshops. There's, it's, like, think of anything, like, normal at a festival, like a, like a conscious festival you can do. Um, and then there's, like, just tons of parties. Like, you can go around every day. There's, like, our camp's doing, like, two or three parties this week. And, um, like, I don't drink alcohol, so they also have, like, non-alcoholic ones. 
And then something that's really cool is because everything is completely free, they even have an airport here. And if you go in the morning, like Raquel goes every year in the morning, you can go at sunrise and you can ask for a ride and they will for free take you up in the, an airplane and go over all of Burning Man. So we're going to do that. I'm so excited. So like the thing is, is like it's from an embodiment level. It's like, you know, there's going normally there's going to be like 70,000 people here and everything is for free and you just bicycle around and you can get a drink you can get food you can get a massage you can get your nails done um you can go to a workshop and like everything is for free for an entire week so from an embodiment level this is really showing our brains and our bodies like what it can be like in a new earth environment and of course, this is out in the desert. It's super extreme. People are like, why do they need to go out in the desert and how it be really extreme? Well, for one, it's we're in America where there's a lot of like legal uh, laws and they don't have to have as many out here. So it's like it's kind of this free. Pl- it's, they call it like a blank canvas, like a, f- a playground where you can do whatever you want. And for a lot of people that are from the States and also tons of people fly in outside of the States like us. This is a beautiful experience of people just completely living in like radical self-reliance, freedom, and everyone helping each other. So a lot of people think that Burning Man is like, oh, it's this like party or whatever. It's like, no, this is like a community experience of people out in the middle of nowhere. We're like, literally, there's no life. There's no bugs. There's no animals. There's no plants. And we're just showing up and like figuring it out together and everyone's bringing supplies everyone's sharing everyone's helping each other and if you've never lived in a community like i grew up in a community like this but if you've never lived in any sort of like collective community where people really have each other's backs this is a life-changing experience to be able to feel what that feels like in your body you know so i just find that really fascinating and super exciting um and I'm excited for all of it. Like it doesn't officially start until tomorrow because we came early for to help set up our camp. And even then, I think it starts like tomorrow night and it goes for a whole week. So I will be making <laughs> more. <laughs> Everyone by my camp is like looking at me like, what is she doing? Because <laughs> I'm like up here recording stuff. Um, I will be reporting more about how it goes. We're actually going to, this is like the first edition of our recording studio because uh, I think like Raquel had this really great idea to make a recording studio that so that when we, you know, go through something or we come back from an adventure, we can just sit down and like record it really fast. And then I'll make a bunch of vlogs from all of that or different podcast stuff. And I think it'll be super fun. Um, so yeah, I want to share, let me drink some chai. Oh my god, this chai is amazing. It's the brand is called Oregon Chai, and I love it so much. Um, I wish we had bought so much more for this week. Um, <laughs> so now I, I would love to share about um, what Luna was asking me yesterday, which was like basically, how did you get into your, like, how did you become like, what is the word like I guess embodied and your in your self pleasure and your like sensuality and for me this has been like such an interesting journey because <laughs> it, it is like not a journey that most people go through <laughs> like I guess it, what I mean by that is like it's not like a standard but I mean is anything standard I don't know I'll just share my journey so I grew up like in an environment where like you know my dressing was always needing to be more modest according to my dad and like basically my sensuality my sexuality was really discouraged or encouraged to be suppressed I guess I'll put it that way and I remember being like 12 years old and coming home and my dad saying something to me like Brittany you know you have more power over men than you realize and I was like what are you talking about dad and he's like I don't want (laughs) <laughs> so my dad sometimes would, would speak in like cryptic language that even I didn't understand and like one time he's like I don't want you bringing home any Jack or Jills and I was like dad I don't know what you're talking about and this is not like you know an American expression this is like I really have no clue what he was talking about 
And I think for my dad, it was really hard to talk about any of this stuff. Like he doesn't have, or at the time growing up, he didn't have any emotional tools. Um, and then out pops this very sexual creature that is me. And I didn't realize I was exuding sexuality. This is just, again, who I am. And basically what my dad, he ended up saying, he's basically like, I don't want you to come home pregnant. And I was like 12. I was 12. And I said to him, I, I didn't even know what to say. I was like, dad, what are you talking about? Like, I don't have a boyfriend. I don't, I've never even kissed anyone. Like, I don't know what you're talking about. Um, but this was basically the energy that I was raised in was like, suppress your sexuality. And everyone was scared that somehow I was going to end up pregnant, which is a really weird way. Like literally, <laughs> this will show you how it was growing up in my family. Uh, and my dad would only do this to me. He, I have two sisters that are two years older and younger, so in the middle. But like when we would be getting ready to go to like church meetings and stuff, my dad would have me bend over in front of him to make sure that I didn't have any cleavage showing, to make sure my boobs weren't showing. First off, that's super humiliating and creepy, uh, like to have your dad be like bend over in front of me. Um, and also he wasn't doing it to my sister, so it was only for me only towards me um so but this was like the environment i grew up in was basically like that my sexuality was this like um it was like a weapon that i didn't understand that i had and that and everyone was worried i was going to use it <laughs> but anyways so i got married at 18 it wasn't an arranged marriage um but within the religion uh it's you can't have sex you're not allowed to have sex until you get married so they have these like church conventions that it's like 10 to 12,000 people of Jehovah's Witnesses will get together for like a weekend. So they would rent like huge convention halls in San Francisco. This is all over the world, but I grew up in Sacramento. So we would go to San Francisco and like for like three days you would go to these religious and it was just like talks and stuff. Um, but on the breaks and at lunchtime, all of us teenagers would walk around and it was literally like you were going shopping. So if, you know, me being like 15, 16 years old, I would go around and like, and if there was like a hot guy or something that was also Jehovah's, because you're only allowed to, within the religion, marry Jehovah's Witness. So it was like, we were all like looking for our potential husband or wife. And it was very normal that if you saw someone that you liked, you would stop and talk to them. So by the time you turned 18, you already kind of knew who you wanted to marry. This whole thing is very bizarre to think about and talk about now. But um, when I turned 17, my mom ended up leaving my dad because he started to get like physically abusive. And so we moved to Oregon and stayed with my aunt. And um, there was a couple guys on my radar at that time, but I like they kind of like faded away when we moved. And and then I ended up going and staying with some family friends in Salt Lake City, Utah. And I met my future husband, Ryan. He was a friend of theirs. And he was like four years older. Super nice. He's a Capricorn. I'm a Scorpio. And I would say that we were always really good friends. You know, like, I think he definitely was in love with me, but I wasn't in love with him. And he was also a virgin. <laughs> and we never had sex before we got married. We never even saw each other naked. But we definitely, like, made out a lot, like, kissed a lot, and, like, grinded on each other with our clothes on. It was so funny. Um, just, like, thank you to back on this. But anyways, so we had sex after we got married. We actually had sex in the limo after our wedding ceremony on the way to the reception. That was the first time we had sex. And I definitely, like, the window, you know, screen was up between us and the driver, but I definitely think that he heard the whole thing. <laughs> um, but anyways... I would say that we had a very like abundant sex life and it was it was like a safe place for me to explore my sexuality because you know my ex-husband was really respectful at the beginning and like super nice and we were friends so we were just kind of like rolling around in bed all the time having lots of sex and we probably had sex like at least two times a day for most of the first couple of years we married for six years and even at the end we would still have sex like almost, almost every day um but i would say from a pleasure perspective i for six years of marriage, I, I probably orgasmed twice, twice, <laughs> twice, <laughs> you know, like that I'm conscious of. And the first time was like 
six months into our marriage, we went away for the weekends, and it was the first time my ex-husband like gave me oral sex. And again, the way I was raised, like literally, my grandma <laughs> told me that oral sex like caused like sex STDs, like sexually, sexually. Like I had so much weird programming around anything related to pleasure. So like I thought like oral sex was actually like harmful to my body. <laughs> so anytime my husband tried to get like I was totally fine giving him oral sex, but like anytime he tried to give it to me, I was like, oh no, this is bad, or like this is literally gonna cause like something bad. So <laughs> one time we were like away for six six months into our marriage, and I had a bunch of champagne, which makes me super horny. Uh, and he gave me oral sex, and I, I orgasmed like in a way that I understood that yes, this is what's happening. Um. So I would say that I had a lot of like physical like sex, but like when it comes to like energy and actual orgasm and understanding my own pleasure that happened like later. So after we got divorced, like no one cheated on anyone. I just didn't want to be married to him anymore. I wanted to, and also I didn't want to be in the religion. So left that and, um, let's see here. And I even spent like, I got so <laughs> crazy things about the religion I want to share. Let me just drink some more chai. I invite you to take a deep breath while I drink some chai. Oh my god, it's so fucking good. <laughs> ah, so crazy another crazy thing about Jehovah's Witness religion is that even if you get divorced, like like, you know, on paper with the government, um, within the religion they call it you're still they consider you still spiritually married so the only way that my ex-husband so i got we got divorced like by the state you know by federal law but the only way my ex ex-husband who was still in religion at the time could remarry is if one of us died or one of us slept with someone else and <laughs> this is so crazy because I knew other people where they had gotten divorced and like one of them hired a private investigator because he wanted to get remarried and he needed to prove to the church leaders that his wife was sleeping with someone else. So they had like a private investigator follow his wife and like take photos. <laughs> this is crazy stuff, okay? So I was not going to deal with any of that and I really wanted to like completely be free of my ex-husband and I also wanted him to be completely free of me. So I went out and like slept with a friend of mine um, who was not in the religion and um, I went and told the church leaders and usually you get like privately reproved like which is just means that they tell you like don't do it again and then like that's it but because I lived in Salt Lake at the time where all it's where my ex-husband's family was from and all of his dads and uncles and stuff were the ones who ran the church that I was going to they decided to do what they call excommunication so they like, kicked me out within a week I was like excommunicated which means my entire family cannot talk to me and like both sides of my family are in the religion so it's like and the way they the way they program people is that you know they are encouraging you to come back by not talking to you and you're technically your eternal soul is at stake so not just you in this lifetime but your whole soul is at stake and so it's like a benefit to your soul for them to cut you out of their lives and this is going to encourage you to come back it is such bullshit <laughs> but it does work because it's such manipulation and like literally f so basically i got excommunicated they call it disfellowshipped i got kicked out when i was 24 every single person i knew from zero to 24 is just gone in like one moment and they like announce it from the platform. It's super dramatic. Like Brittany Bond is no longer Jehovah's Witness. And that means that like everyone has to, act, they act like you're a ghost. Like they'll walk right by you and not talk to you. And this is super painful and, hel and hurtful. And at the time I was um, still really close to my family. Like my mom came and like um, came to the last meeting before I was disfellowshipped. And she like cried the whole time as if I was dying because in her reality, I really was. <laughs> Uh, so, um, anyways, I spent like a year and a half coming back into the religion, like showing up for the meetings, the, the religious meetings and saying I wanted to get reinstated. So this connects to my sexuality because I was doing my best to not have sex. I don't think I ended up having sex with anyone during that year and a half, even though I had, I had like people in my life that were, I could, I would consider like by all other 
things that we were boyfriend girlfriend but we were not having sex because i was so like i want to see my family again and then i got reinstated that means like you they allow you back in and it was it's super creepy like the way they do it it's like for a year and a half i had to go to like two meetings religious meetings a week mm-hmm. and everyone had to act like they didn't know me like they just like you're a ghost for two for a year and a half two meetings a week and yeah like my girlfriends yesterday i was talking to them about it and they were like how was that i was like it's fucking traumatic dude like like to have people act like you don't exist yeah like your body is not made for that you know um and then when i was reinstated i told my family like hey i'm I'm reinstated and like we can talk and we can you know and i was really excited um to connect with them again and they told me like my mom and my sister my older sister who was like my best friend growing up they were like oh well we want to like monitor you and see if you're actually doing what you say you're going to do you know like we want to make sure you're actually all the way back in that you're not like bad association and I was like what and at this point my body just could not take it anymore like even towards the end of like getting reinstated I got what's called shingles which means like it's like this rash that is on one side of your body and it's caused by extreme stress. And the only thing to really, and it's so painful. It's like so painful. And the only thing that really helps with the pain is like morphine. And I, when I went to the doctor to confirm that's what it was, she was like the only people that I have seen with this bad of like, um, like of shingles is like people who are have cancer or people who are like super old and are like dying. And she's like, you need to figure out whatever it is that's causing this much stress and like stop. (laughs) And at the time I knew it was the job. I was in a super stressful job in New York City. Um, And also it was the religious stuff. So I ended up going traveling with my travel company. I left like six months earlier than I had planned because I just needed to get out. And I, yeah, I found out that I was going to be, I was reinstated. My family was still super not like wanting to hang out with me and it just was this moment where I was like, I cannot deny who I am anymore. Like I do, I, I choose to put my body in safe places where it feels like safe for me to be my authentic all the self all the way. And for that to be fully accepted. And like, literally it is not safe in my body to put myself in this community anymore. Like it felt like self harm to be like, yeah, I'm going to put myself in this in this environment where people get to like old men get to decide whether I'm worthy or not of hanging out with my family. And I was like, no, I'm not okay with this anymore. And also, I'm not okay with like old white men deciding what I do with my body, like whether I have sex with someone or whether I connect to someone like again, not okay. Because the religion is only run by men. So, and they are a lot more critical of what women do. And it's, it's super, it's like patriarchy to the max, dude. Like it's super annoying. (laughs) Um, it's uh, super annoying if you choose to stay, I chose to leave. So for me, it's more like, um, I feel for all the women that are still in that religion and also why I make these podcasts, because a lot of you who have grown up in this religion reach out to me. And if I can be this voice of like activation, inspiration, that you can leave this religion and have an amazing life or even any sort of conservative religious environment that is disempowering for you, you have the choice to uplevel yourself and get yourself out of there. So anyways, after that, going back to my sexuality (laughs) and my pleasure, um, after that, I, you know, I had this travel company where we had like 20 to 30 people living with us every month. So they would come with their own remote uh, job and we would we were we would basically like it was like a co-living pop-up so we would like a country a month around the world we'd rent like you know a bunch of villas next to each other in Bali or at a whole apartment complex in in Berlin or like one time we we rented a castle in um, Italy it was super fun super epic and you were just and so basically they they would just pay like a membership a monthly like rent membership fee and we would handle where they're staying, make sure they have Wi-Fi. And usually we'd partner with like a local co-working space. And then we would like plan fun things to do on the weekend. And so it was just like so much fun. And there was always these beautiful men that would come on these trips, you know. And so I started connecting with some of them. And um, one of them, I remember when I was in Portugal, uh, I was sleeping with one of these guys <laughs> that came on my travel company. And 
it was the first time where I really understood like how much like women can enjoy pleasure because he told me like straight up he was like this Polish guy like beautiful tall big Polish guy and he was just like it is my job as a man to make sure that you orgasm before I like an enter you or before I get any pleasure out of the situation like literally it is my job to make sure you receive the maximum amount of pleasure and that you're open and receptive energetically and physically for me to have sex with you. And if you don't want that, and if your body's not open to that, then none of this is going to happen. And I was like, okay, this is the standard now. Yes, thank you, universe, for giving this man into my life. Because I remember there, it's like this old, like, um, bed post that was in my bedroom. Like, this, like, very, like, uh, um, beautiful and, like, wooden, uh, I don't know, I can't describe it, but just, like, imagine, like, intricate designs and like old fashioned and like really epic looking and I was like holding on to one of the bedposts while he was <laughs> giving me oral sex and I just like was holding on so much and like screaming like in a pleasurable way that like I pulled off one of the bedposts because I was just like ah! <laughs> you know so that became my standard um and yeah we had amazing sex and it was um it was definitely like friends like friends with benefits like it was also really nice to show me that like you can have pleasure with people that are safe and like um that can be your friends and it doesn't need to lead to this like and now we're married because like my brain literally was programmed to anytime you're interested in someone it needs to be like is this my future husband so then like after that i just i ended up still having like long-term monogamous relationships um they call it like serial monogamy because like almost the second I broke up with someone I was in another relationship with someone else um and that was really beautiful because I always ended up with men who really enjoyed sex like the guy I dated after that he was also we were born on the same day month day and year so two Scorpios in bed we had some pretty great sex um but then I wanted to I I I kind of wanted to feel what it felt like to be able to be completely like freedom for me is really important like so like the idea of like freedom and also deep connection so then I explored the idea of like open relating and um I've had a couple open relationships since I've decided to do that like so I would say two and a half because the third one like the half of one was like we said we were going to be open but we never were because my ex-boyfriend was not okay with it um and just in general like even after I left so talking just about like my sensuality like me expressing myself and my sensuality like I feel like because my first real situation of like being fully sexual was with my ex-husband and like a very like within my programming it was a super safe environment for me to explore my sexuality so for me that was like really a nice way and so I've always felt like really supported in I don't know I've always just felt super protective and supported by the universe for me expressing my sexuality like uh, you know I I was sexually molested when I was a kid like eight years old by my neighbor like seven to eight years old and that was super traumatic but it like nothing I never took on this programming that like I needed to shut myself down like I I got a lot of that programming through my religion and I like when I was in my religion I did my best to accommodate that and like dress more modestly or like not be as my flirty self. But since leaving the religion, I've really let all of that go. And especially going to Copenhagen where it's like such a safe space to like express yourself and your full like goddess woman sexuality. Like I would say that because on the island, like women are wearing like super sexual outfits, like, and you know we're naked a lot a lot (laughs) we're just naked a lot like we go to we have beaches that are for naked when you're at the waterfall you're naked at home i'm naked a lot we have play parties it's like a super sexually expressive space even at ecstatic dances like people are dressed uh, dressing super you know outside world we call it very provocative but for us it's just like being expressive and being feeling yummy in our body to be in our sexual power and embodiment and yeah like going to the island like it was like the last kind of like piece of the puzzle that like locked in me feeling fully good in my in my sexual expression one thing I think that is really important to say is like everyone I feel like everyone can be fully embodied in their sexuality and their sensuality if they have the appropriate and feel safe so they can do that no matter what but if you want to feel safe in that I really recommend to have 
built up really good boundaries and be very comfortable expressing your boundaries because you're going to go out in the world and interact with people who are like not used to women like right now we're on this like uh what is it the breaking point or tipping point tipping point <laughs> i'm like what's the word we're on this tipping point where women are being like hey i'm so done with being like suppressed in in my embodiment and my expression and my pleasure like a woman's connection to her pleasure is her connection to her her abundance her life force energy because as a woman like our us being like feeling good in our bodies and feeling expressive and this yummy energy of us being in our pleasure of just literally enjoying life like this is what i love to flirt because for me flirting is not one invite it's not an invitation to get anything from anyone it's not it's not me trying to manipulate anyone it's literally me sharing my gratefulness and just sheer pleasure of this human experience with the world this energy of yumminess in my body of me just being like mm, it feels so good to be in my body oh my gosh yeah that's like yeah how do you feel oh my goodness yeah like to me that is so fun and i feel like if every every woman felt safe to be in this energy of like i call it flirting with life and then like you know like uh something that you can do as a homework is literally just go and flirt with everything like a dog a cat the lady who takes your money at starbucks like whatever and just be like oh my gosh thank you so much and it, again it doesn't need to be this like geared towards romance you know it doesn't need to be an invitation for anyone to do anything with you it's just like pure like enjoyment of life and the thing is, is when you go out and you interact with people and you're in this yummy energy, it is such a fr fresh and new experience for a lot of people, especially men, for a woman to just be fully in her pleasure of just enjoyment of life, that they might mistake it for an invitation. And this is where the boundaries really come in. This is where, it and, and all you have to do, you don't have to get out of your yummy energy. All you have to do is be like, no, thank you. No, nope, there wasn't an invitation. I just wanted to be nice. Okay, bye. You know, and like get yourself out of that situation where you can be in a situation that feels better for you and supportive. Like, I'll give you an example. So one of my really good friends on the island, I consider him like a brother, a spiritual brother to me. His name's Aaron. And at one point, Aaron was living at my house. Uh, this is like a couple years ago. And he invited a friend um, from Israel to come stay. And I love this this friend. I'll, we'll call him We'll call him Ben. So Ben came to stay with us. And to this day, I'm still good friends with Ben. Oh, I just realized he's at Bernie. And oh my gosh, I'm so excited. So Ben, we hit it off super well, like as friends. And he was on the island for a week. It was his first time coming to visit. And him and Aaron are like, like they go way back. Like they were at university together. And um, so all three of us, so he came to stay w at my house as well. So all three of us were living at my house for a week. And... We just got closer and closer and Aaron, so Aaron's married and him and his wife are like some of my best friends and his wife was just out traveling. So like Aaron and I are non-sexual. We're just like literally brother and sister. But this Ben guy, I feel like he, you know, it was his first time also to the island, right? So basically one night we're cuddling, me and Ben are cuddling on my day bed. And for me, this is very normal to cuddle with my friends on the island. And he just starts like grabbing my boob. And I was just like, what are you doing, Ben? And he's like, oh, oh, I'm really sorry. I thought like, I thought like basically like I thought this was an invitation. And I was like, Ben, nothing's an invitation. <laughs> Just because I'm cuddling with you does not mean that I want to be romantic or sexual with you. And he was like, I'm so sorry. I didn't know. And I, so I talked to Aaron about it the next day, like Aaron and I went and got coffee by ourselves. And I was like, dude, Aaron, what's up? Like, you know, and we invite Ben into our house and his and like you know me just being my normal self and like why is he thinking this is an invitation to like grab my boob or like you know like go romantic with me or sexual and Aaron was like Brittany you have to understand that most of the world has this very deep programming that like anytime anyone's being nice or e even if it's like you know, caring touch, like the touch that you would only have with your family. Cause like, you know, Aaron and I hug each other all the time. We tell each other, we love each other all the time. It's never sensual. It's never sexual. And that's the kind of touch that I was giving Ben 
which is like the the kind of like touch you would give your mom <laughs> or you know like you would hug hug your brother or your sister or whatever and he went sensual sexual and and what Aaron says is like you know most of the world doesn't have this programming and so they don't understand so when you are being yourself which is like this fully embodied woman this goddess woman in her power and you know and you're sharing this energy it might get confused sometimes some people might get confused by this and I was like that's fine I'm super fine with that but uh not in my house (laughs) you know so I just want to share this that like even for me there's times where I have to express my boundaries and for me it wasn't I didn't feel unsafe I didn't feel scared I I was just kind of confused because I had been living in the reality of Copenhagen for a couple of years at this point like through COVID where I literally hadn't left the island and so for me like literally everyone around me was on the same page of like what is consent what does invitations actually mean and all this stuff so if you're out there in the world the thing I want to say is that we are all if you're listening to this and you're resonating with this we are all like these leaders of what we can embody so like especially if you're a woman listening to this like yes it is probably going to be misconstrued sometimes when you're being your yummy vibrant self but that is not a reason to shut yourself down that is a reason to be extra and be even more vibrant so that And it's also going to be times where you're going to have to speak up your boundaries and say, no, this is not what I'm actually sharing with you. I'm just sharing my energy. It's not an invitation. It doesn't mean I owe you anything. It doesn't mean I want anything. It's just me sharing my energy. So like you can fuck off, you know? So sometimes you have to be goddess mode, tell people to fuck off. But also it doesn't like, I've spent some times in my life where I was in this kind of like defensive, like, yeah, I was in my, I was in my, sexual embodiment but I was almost like defensive about it because I felt unsafe so I invite you to do what you need to do to feel safe first like foundationally you got to feel safe but on top of that it's important to I think also be surrounded by other people who are on the same page of like how you want to embody yourself because like for instance I'm here with like Raquel and Luna and Luna wants to be more in her sensuality or sexuality and she was saying that it's really nice to be around Raquel and I because we're a lot more open about this stuff. Um, so it's important to be around people that can encourage this for you and to invite and, and be a safe space for you to express yourself. And if you don't know if you have these people, you can also create this group. You can just tell your girlfriends like, hey, let's let's flirt today. Let's have fun. Let's like let's be like sexy. And it's so much fun. And I really believe that as women, like we need to encourage this about each other we need to create more opportunities for us to be in our pleasure and just to enjoy ourselves and feel sexy and also if you're a man listening to this I invite you to create safe spaces for the women around you and you know it's if you want to appreciate them and their beauty please do like please actually like verbally say that because women like we love to be appreciated the thing that will make it a positive interaction is if and all you have to do is do it in the energy of like giving and women when we receive compliments from men we can feel this energy it's not something you need to say it's just like basically like if you just say i just want you to know you look really beautiful today and that's it you can even like walk away you don't whatever you know like and just basically do it with this intention you can just say in your head i am giving this this compliment with the intention of just giving without needing anything and a woman will feel that and that's really beautiful so for me that's creating more and more safe spaces and also to always check in and ask for consent and you know never assume anything even if a woman is is being super vibrant and in her pleasure that does not mean that she's inviting you to do anything (sighs) so anyways lots of things but basically like I feel like me just being super in my Scorpio energy is like I'm already kind of just this, like I just, this is who I am, like this embodiment of sexuality, sensuality. So when Luna was asking me yesterday, like, how did you get like this? Like, what is your journey? So I think part of it is like, yeah, this is who I am. But also, I feel like I am this way so that I can be extra so that all of you can feel like you can do it too. Like, you know, like, I'll go all the way to the extreme of this so that you can feel more, more open to like oh my god I think my words are not working anymore but basically like 
you know, you need someone to kind of set the example and go like a little bit farther and like express it a little bit more so that you can feel like, like if someone's coming all the way up here, you can go like halfway and be like, oh, well, if she went all that way, then I can at least go this far, you know? So I hope to be that for all of you. Ah, so this is my first reporting live from Burning Man. And I will leave you all here and send you lots of love. And I hope to see you in the next episode.